Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 5.22 and in this lesson we're going to specifically take a look at our first oscillator. So just one oscillator, the first stage here in our signal path and we're going to be focusing on these three knobs, the pitch, the shape, and our octave control. Now, I would encourage you from this point moving forward to not only have a nice init patch saved so that you can keep going to that at the start, but also to watch these videos in full screen and in HD. I'm not going to be able to zoom in on the instrument because we are going to be going back to our handy dandy span here uh, a number of times moving forward. Also, I would encourage you to check out this website here. A lot of what we're going to talk about in the next few videos and really for the whole rest of this series has to do with harmonics and overtones. And I talked about that a lot at the beginning of the course. And if you remember some of that stuff, you're going to be making a ton of connections here. But if you've maybe forgotten and you don't want to go back and watch those videos, I encourage you to check this page out uh, from the University of Oregon. I'll link to it in the description. It's a phenomenal resource, and I'd encourage you to look at it every single day until you can pretty much recite everything on here verbatim because it's going to not only tie together some loose ends that you might be uh, wondering about, but it's also going to um, just be a great resource for you and, and underpin a lot of our concepts here with sound synthesis. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So right now our mix is set to 0%, which is AKA 100% to oscillator one. If I fling it all the way to the other side, we're on oscillator two. For now, let's keep it on oscillator one, our filter's wide open, and we're just gonna have our buzzing sawtooth waveform. And we can see as I'm hitting this, I'm playing a C note and our fundamental AKA the first note or the one that's hyped the most on the frequency spectrum on our span here is a C. So we're playing C3 right now and it's adhering to the equal temperament system which sets A4 at 440. All right, we've talked about that many times. Now I have a pitch control here and this pitch control is pretty interesting because if I take this to its extreme, we go to a setting of plus seven semitones. So let's think about the C major scale real quick. We have obviously seven degrees. We have C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Okay, the perfect fifth, so one of the most consonant intervals apart from the octave or the note itself is seven semitones up, AKA the perfect fifth. So when I play this, it's actually gonna be playing a G even though I'm hitting the C key. And you can see that here. If I zoomed all the way in, I'd be able to get it perfect. So not plus or minus however many cents. So one big issue with this right off the bat is you don't want to be messing around with your first oscillator's pitch beyond say, I don't know. You can take it as far as like plus 0.49 Okay, once I go to 0.51, it's going to sound more like a C sharp than it is going to sound like a C. But below 0.5 or so, we are going to still be mostly hearing C. And sometimes it is good to detune this by just a few cents left or right. And I'll talk about why you might want to do that with other oscillators later. Um, it relates back to concepts we've talked about dealing with phase and detuning and widening our sound. But for now, let's just go ahead and lock this pitch in at zero. So we're playing our C. This little selector below is indicating our octave. And we have a little eight with a dash, which is saying eight feet. Hmm, very interesting. We talked about the pipe organ before, and this is all coming back to our pipe organs. So the longer the pipe organ, the more time the air has to travel through the pipe, the longer the wavelength is going to be produced. And we know that the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency that's going to come out or the lower the pitch. In our case here, we are dealing with pitches. So at eight feet, we're playing a C3. At 16 feet, 
we're talking again a two to one ratio so we know this is going to be an octave we should be playing a c2 and there you can see c2 if i pull it all the way to 32 feet it's going to be kind of hard to hear but it will be a c1 which should be somewhere in this area up here we can also do it the other way so from 32 to 16 feet to 8 feet to 4 feet should be a C4 which it is and then we have a C5 and a C6 I'm not gonna play those they are gonna be incredibly piercing but if you don't believe me feel free to open it up and check it out for yourself all right, so that's pretty cool, and that's hearkening back to early synthesizers as well. They did a bit of a shout-out to the pipe organ and uh, would include these various lengths to, you know, say, here's how you control your octaves. Last but not least, we have our shapes. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting knob. Right now, let's focus on the two extremes. You can see we have an image here showing what we are doing. Sadly, we don't have an oscilloscope, which I'd love to pull up right now because it's a very helpful teaching tool. Instead, we're going to have to rely on the span for harmonics, and we're going to have to trust that what we see here is accurate, which it is. So right now, we're playing a saw wave. And if we want, we can go into that University of Oregon page and see what they have to say a saw wave is. So the sawtooth wave is every harmonic, both odd and even harmonics. And we've talked about how those harmonics are going to form and where they should be logically. So we know that with a note that's a C, for example, we can expect to see our odds our odd notes popping up here when we look at those overtones, which would be things like the third, the fifth, the seventh, that includes our triad, right? One, three, five. And so we'll be able to see all of those when we go through here, but it also includes the even numbers as well, the two, the four, and the six. So although it includes the perfect fourth, it also includes the intervals of the second, which is you know the most dissonant in the scale. If we play them at the same time, it's gonna give almost a beating effect. And also the six, which a lot of times is avoided um, you know, in some of our Western harmony, at least it doesn't have to be, but it just has been over time because of how that relationship sounds. But if I play this back, we can look at these harmonics and see where they fall. So we have a C, we have a C. Let's try to catch these. There's a G. So that's the perfect fifth. And we're going to think about this in relation to our C major scale. We have another C. We'll just zoom in and check some of these. an F, an E, a D. So we're seeing all of those. We're seeing the second. We're seeing the fourth. We're seeing both odd and even harmonics. And if we take a look at that diagram, it's going to be very helpful to us. We can see how that's sloping down. So early on, synthesis pioneers realized that the saw wave, because of the fact that as we go up, we have this sharp curve, would introduce all of these harmonics and very natural sounding harmonics as well. They all fit and fall into like the scale we're playing. So if we're playing a C major scale and we're playing our songs in C, we know that by hitting all these different notes, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna stay completely in tune. They also realize that utilizing this wave shape, which we see has two 90 degree cuts in it, is going to only evoke odd ordered harmonics. And the odd ordered harmonics are the ones that are so important in Western harmony, the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh. And so if I play this saw wave, it's gonna sound slightly different. And we can also see that there's not as many of these. So it's actually gonna play an octave lower as well. You can see our fundamental is now C2. And as we track these overtones, they're all going to be odd ordered harmonics. And we can just go through a few of those here. C, G, etc etc going down the list there okay so if we want we can take a look at what they have to say about the square wave 
And as you can see, odd numbered harmonics. And we can also take a look at how these fall down going on. All right, so what's interesting is we have the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and then the ninth. Okay, so what is the ninth? The ninth is actually our second, just an octave up. And in the case of playing music and making chords and the like, it's much more acceptable to play the ninth than it is to play the second because the second is so close and it's going to sound very, very dissonant. If we play the ninth, it's going to be also now not quite as hyped, much lower down. Same with the 11th and the 13th. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense to you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Now in Bitwig, what we have is an ability to morph between these two, and that's what makes this a wavetable. So we have our uh, square wave on one side, we have our saw wave on the other, and we can actually blend between these two. And again, this is working as a percentage. So we can just take a listen and watch how as we start to pull this up and approach saw wave territory, we'll start to see some of these harmonics popping up. So instead of just having odd ordered harmonics, we'll see the even ones creeping in here as well. start to see those even harmonics popping in and this is where it would look really cool in a um, oscilloscope as well it would basically look like this we can watch as the square wave becomes deconstructed and starts becoming more like a saw shape so right at the middle we have a blend of both a saw and a square and then as we go all the way we're going to get just a saw territory So those, um, some of those odd harmonics are going to start to fall away or not be heightened quite as much, which is going to leave room for the even harmonics to come in as well. Okay, so I encourage you to kind of mess with this, take a look at it. You can even print it to audio and zoom way in to see the waveform. But that's the basis of those three knobs right there. They're very critical. They're important that you understand these relationships and start to understand why early synthesizers only had things like square waves and saw waves because they evoked all of the harmonics that they needed to evoke. And what I'm going to show you really quick is I want to show you something with the most famous wavetable synthesizer of all, and that's Massive. So in Massive, what they do is they provide for you a bunch of different waveforms that are shaped much differently from what we see here. Okay, and all that means is that they're gonna be hyping different harmonics and the relative levels of those is going to depend on the waveform itself. And there's a great website here where they actually go over all of the different wavetables when you are on the farthest left to the furthest right. And I find it kind of cool to look at this because you realize some of them look just completely random. And when they look completely random, they're also going to sound completely random. And one of the reasons why working with just saw waves and uh, square waves is so helpful is we're going to continue that tradition of working um, with very logical harmonics and overtones. And there's other things we can do to hype various parts in the harmonic spectrum. But I just want to show you Massive really quick. I don't use it, but it is a very, very cool synthesizer. We can open it up here, and we actually see that by default, we have a square and a saw. So right now it's on saw wave. I guess it makes sense to pull it the other direction. But I can pull it back and get a square wave. Now there are some really interesting wavetables in here. Let's just pick one at random. Let's do Dirty Needle. And now let's look at the spectrum. Crazy, right? And we can see what happens as we pull it. So what I want you to get out of this is a couple of things. 
number one, just how important the harmonic series is and how those harmonics are interacting with that fundamental, how crucial that is in coming up with a timbre. Now, when we have access to something like a saw wave, which is going to hype both odd and even ordered harmonics, we should be able to come up with a ton of different interesting sounds, especially when we start to use filters and the like. I'm showing you Massive because I want you to see that Massive is not that much different from the polysynth. The only difference is that we have a bunch of different wavetables to choose from inside of something like Massive. And some of those are going to sound incredibly dissonant and are going to be really buzzy in certain parts of the frequency spectrum. And people like to use those because it gives their sounds so much richness. And in a lot of cases with like bass music or with something like dubstep, for example, you want really, really dirty sounding synth patches. And the way to evoke more dirtiness is to have complete randomness and craziness in the harmonic spectrum. So I hope this video has been helpful to you guys. I hope you can start to see and understand just how powerful a synthesizer is, even if it just has saw and square waves. Thank you for watching, and you'll hear from me again in the next lesson. Take care.